Welcome to Logger Lectures Online, part of our series of digital lectures presented by the McMaster Alumni Association. These in-person and online lectures are named after are. McMaster graduate Albert Abram Logger, a great believer in the value of lifelong education. He created the Albert Abram Logger Foundation, which supports several organizations in their efforts, including the McMaster Alumni Association. Good evening. My name is Chris Gajanski and I work on the alumni team at McMaster. My job is to arrange events that showcase our exceptional faculty and alumni with the goal of keeping alumni and friends connected to and proud of McMaster. We want you to be our ambassadors in the world. And our team has been working hard to continue to offer virtual programming that is educational and engaging. Things definitely look different now that we can't gather in person, but there are benefits to this way of gathering. We love that our alumni and friends can participate no matter where they are. And even if you can't be with us during the live event, you can watch it later on your own time. A bit of housekeeping, you'll be able to ask questions during the event using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we encourage you to add questions sooner rather than later for Joshna to answer when she finishes her talk. And tonight, I'm so very pleased to introduce you to Joshna Maharaj, who graduated from Mac in 2000 with a degree in religious studies. She received the inaugural GTA Impact Award in 2014 from McMaster alumni in recognition of the success of her work since leaving campus. After graduating, she traveled to and lived in India for a year, where she at one point was roped into an ashram kitchen. And when she returned to Toronto, she went to cooking school. And that was the launch of her career in what she calls social gastronomy, a combination of culinary expertise and community activism. She's worked in community kitchens at Ryerson University, overhauling their hospitality system to be one that focused on nutrition and freshness. And then at a Scarborough hospital where she reinvented patient food to be fresh, nutritious, local, and most importantly, healing. She recently published her book called Take Back the Tray about revolutionizing institutional food. Now her focus has broadened further. It spans from the plate of food all the way to the ground in which the food is grown. She's done TED Talks. She's very active on social media and you often hear her on CBC radio, read about her in national newspapers and in popular Canadian magazines. And we are very lucky to have her all to ourselves this evening. Welcome, Joshna. Thank you, thank you. It's super lovely to be here. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. It's really awesome to connect this way. I haven't had a good McMaster connection in a long time, uh, and it's really nice uh, to do this. So I have a presentation and some slides. We'll talk. I'll chat uh, for about. Uh, 35 40 minutes and then you all have provided some questions and hopefully you'll generate more uh, please feel free i love answering questions so i look forward to that um, and with that i will share my screen and off we go okay Okay, so uh, some of you hopefully uh, have had the chance to take a look at the film Kiss the Ground. That was a little bit of homework that was included in the registration package if you've had a chance. Uh, no worries if you haven't, this will all hopefully still make great sense uh, without that. And I encourage you all to watch it uh, because it is a very hopeful, very positive uh, movie and we can all use a bit of good news right now. Uh, so. Uh, onwards with a discussion about the hope of regenerative agriculture. Uh, first though, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this pandemic and where we're in and how we're living and, um, and sort of what uh, the important food uh, elements of this uh, moment in time that I have noticed and why I think that's meaningful. Um, oops, sorry. So first up, the pandemic has revealed a lot of truth about our food system. Uh, and just so we're clear on what I'm talking about, uh, the food system is a complex web of activities involving the production, processing, transport, and consumption of food. 
Issues concerning the food system include the governance and economics of food production, its sustainability, the degree to which we waste food, how food production affects the natural environment, and the impact of food on individual and population health. That is a mega paragraph of a lot of things, but essentially, what I, the reason I put this here was to let you know how, what I'm talking about, what I mean when I refer to the food system, and to really connect to the depth, right, and the breadth of this system, and how many uh, sort of sets of hands and people and businesses uh, are involved. So, because food is our common denominator as humans, there are many manifestations of these truths, right? The way that food kind of pops up and the way the issues show up are all over the place because the one thing we all have a vested interest in as humans is food and, and our access to food. So what happened at the start of the pandemic? Uh, let's talk about what happened in stores, right? This was the vibe of the shop of the grocery stores and it kind of blew me away. I'd never seen a thing like this. Um, groceries were hoarded, right? And uh, the other, I mean, sort of the other really awesome side of things is that home cooking spiked, right? Lots of, lots of hours were being clocked at home. I was delighted about it as somebody who was really encouraging people to invest more time in cooking their own food. The fact that we were kind of forced into it this way was pretty delightful, right? And at the beginning uh, in March, I, I had it in my head. I know that it takes 21 days to build a new habit. And so I so naively at that time was like, oh, I hope this lasts at least 21 days so we can all uh, develop a new habit, which is sort of laughable at this stage in the game. Uh, but then we saw changes and impacts starting to happen on farms, right? Farmers and producers had to really pivot uh, and get creative about their business to find different ways to get their wares to market. I'm sure everybody has, has um, experienced some version of a curbside pickup for something now. Uh, farmers markets where you can order things online and then go to like literally a spot on the highway or a, you know some very you know it was very grassroots kind of move that we've seen um, and and what I think was fascinating about this was that so many farmers would have never done this right they would never push themselves to build an online platform that would have never been a thing but then when the stakes got as high as they did everyone kind of scrambled and was forced into it. And I have heard a lot of really positive messages from farmers about how that part is gonna stay. That part of the business will now stay because it's very effective, it's very efficient, and it did a really good job of connecting them to their customers, which is a fascinating piece. Um, other stuff on farms, not so exciting. So this is uh, stacks and stacks of potatoes uh, that are being harvested, but with no buyers, right? If you can imagine, really these potatoes would have been French fries, right? But because we were not at ball games and we weren't in cafeterias and restaurants, uh, all of these, but these are farmers in Idaho in the US, right? This is, this is the volume of surplus production we see when we all, you know, crowd, crowd into our homes. There was a very similar story being told with liquid dairy milk because all those cafes that ordered cases and cases and cases of milk every day no longer were ordering any of them. We weren't picking up lattes on the corner. Uh, and so a uh, dumping of huge amounts of milk had to happen because we had so fundamentally changed our behavior. Now there was a, there's um, job loss obviously was a part of this, right? The shutdown, people stopped working. Um, and so anytime we talk about people losing their income, we automatically have to have a conversation about food security or food insecurity as it would be, right? Uh, and when I talk about food security, I mean a person, a family, a community's ability to act, to have reliable access to good quality, uh, nutritious food uh, within some some walkable distance of where they live. They need to be able to afford it, know how to cook it, all those sorts of things. Um, so this, um, there's an organization here in Toronto called The Stop. I am very closely connected. I was the chef there for five years. They're a community food center dealing with very grassroots uh, food security issues. And this was a note um, that came from The Stop on April 3rd. So it's just about two weeks into our lockdown. Um, and you can see uh, that the numbers they're saying that 220 of the food bank hampers in the first two weeks were for households who had never before used our, their food bank, right? And of those 220, 146 were for households outside of the catchment area. 
so uh, I will tell you that now we're at the end of October, the numbers are quite staggering, right? We are looking at three and 400% increases in the number of people walking through the door for community meals for food bank hampers. Um, and the resources are obviously thinning out. Um, but it's really important to connect to the fact that these, there's an inevitability around food insecurity. As soon as, as, soon as people stop working and incomes disappear, uh, food security is a, is a necessary, like it's an automatic thing. And we have to sort of have our eyes open to the fact that this has to, you know, roll down somewhere, particularly in a province, in a country that has really thinned out its social safety net, right? It is it, it, where we, we all, everybody wanted to turn to a social safety net, but it is threadbare, right? With lots of holes. And the work that people were doing at the stop even before the pandemic began was barely meeting the need. Uh, so this is becoming an increasingly huge issue. It's something that I'm deeply invested in because uh, our food system has to work for everybody, right? It's just, it's simply not going to work if it only works for people who can afford it. Um, especially because now we're in a point where so many more people are unable to afford good food. Uh, here's another, this photo blows my mind. Look at this. This is a photo of a drive through food bank lineup in the U.S., right? It is really shocking. I thought it was one of those parking lots at the airport. That's what that reminded me of. Uh, and just think, I mean, awesome that they were able to fashion a drive through experience, but just look at all those people and all that need. And this was April, right? This is not even now or yesterday. Uh, and so this, I can't, I, clearly this is, this is an issue that I'm super passionate about, but it's something uh, that I, we don't think enough about until crazy moments like this, when we all find ourselves potentially needing to use some of these supports to realize, you know, how thin and unavailable they really are, uh, is a really, is a, is a, is a, an important wake up call, let's say. Now, uh, other manifestations though outside of this and really connected to the jobs piece is um, the rollout to industry and what that meant, right? Particularly, I wanna focus on meat processing plants, right? I thought it was super interesting to see the way the virus spread in meat processing plants had nothing to do with actual, it wasn't like it was the, the virus was foodborne and people were consuming the meat and then getting sick. This was happening because of the working conditions in these places. Right, and that is a very important distinction. It's because you can see now at the bottom, uh, these folks who are working have little plexiglasses, but you know, there's plexi sort of sheets between them, masks and, and bonnets on. Um, but previously, everybody was crammed together, uh, working really closely together with animals uh, in, in, in this very volatile scenario. And it's not nothing that the that we saw outbreaks the us you can see the concentration of outbreaks in the us and we saw them here in quebec and in alberta originally um but i leave but down on the left there there's a shot of the tyson waterloo um plant which just recently reported huge amounts uh another outbreak and this article on the top left is from a few days ago october 18th uh about the fact that there's an outbreak at a meat processing plant so this is a really important piece uh, for us to think about our food system and how elements of our food system are not resilient to things like an outbreak, right? Uh, what I thought was sort of wild was that simultaneously I was doing research and I found great bits of information about the most Googled recipes through the pandemic, right? Obviously, uh, banana bread, banana bread, the whole world, the most Googled recipe in the world. It's really extraordinary. Uh, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. Uh, somebody said to me, it's because everybody has a couple of brown, sad bananas in the back of their freezer. And because everyone was in lockdown and sort of clearing things out, the bananas surfaced. And somebody else said that you generally always have the ingredients in your house to knock together a banana bread. But banana bread, the most Googled recipe in the world. However, at the same time, uh, Google actually went into... Uh, gave us a breakdown by state in the U.S. We sadly don't have this Canadian information, but by state in the U.S., they gave us a breakdown. And here's what's so fascinating. The top, the highest concentration, the like the most Googled among, was among 12 states who were all Googling hamburger recipes, right? Which kind of blows my mind uh, because a hamburger is a very easy thing to make. But let's think about this bit of news, the idea that the top, the top most Googled recipe in 12 of 50 states was hamburger recipes, side by side with the, the idea that spikes in requirements for ground meat, right, were pushing 
uh, demand in meat processing plants and forcing overtime and extra effort, right? It's just, I, it was such a perfect illustration of the impact of our choices, of our consumer choices, right? Everyone's like, we want to make burgers. We want to learn how to make burgers. Amazing. So we're going to go to Costco and we're going to buy that big long tray of ground beef times how many thousand of us, uh, which meant a rapid fire increase in production on meat packing facility and meat processing facilities, which were not safe environments, uh, resulting in outbreaks, right? It's just, it's so interesting that a potentially, you know, a potentially innocent move in lockdown to try and learn how to cook something can in fact have these really dramatic impacts. Uh, that to me, I, I love that bit of truth. Um, so what does this all mean, <laughs> right? All of these things were happening. All of these manifestations uh, of food impact was happening. So now what, right? What do we do now? Uh, and there's lots of answers to that, but I want to first just ground you a little bit in some thinking about the original. Let's take a minute to consider the point of our relationship with food. Um, very basically, food is the way we receive nutrients from the earth. One uh, March, a while ago, I was planting seedlings in my living room and a farmer pal of mine came over to visit and she casually mentioned, she casually gave me this line, food is the way we receive nutrients from the earth. And I was like, wait a second. I had never, I was like, hold on. I had never really thought about that. I had never really considered the idea that, that the earth had nutrition inside of it that I needed to stay alive. And that food was the very glorious delivery mechanism for that nutrition, right? As seen here so beautifully uh, with the cross section of these roots. Uh, and that, that changed everything for me, right? I was like, oh, right, okay. Which in turn to me means that food is how we stay alive. Right? And it's really important as we are in this moment and we're really sort of evaluating our food system and our relationship with food to keep this central and focused, right? We cannot imagine a food system or reimagine a food system that does not first meet this primary function for all of us, right? By virtue of the fact that we are human beings, I believe strongly that access to good food is a very basic human right. Uh, and so this is literally my roots on this issue and, and a place that I think we have to start this whole conversation from. So what does this mean? Now what, right? What have we learned from this? Um, and one of the most important lessons, whoops, is that the vulnerabilities of the industrial food system have revealed themselves undeniably. That, that it just, the underbelly of that has really come sort of hanging out. Uh, but what is the industrial food system? What are we talking about here? So here's uh, a, a tidy uh, definition. Industrial food systems are characterized by a focus on specific crops that come with specific research and development with specific transport, etc. This means that the path that is defined is really difficult to change, very difficult to include other types of food systems there. These food systems are very, very much export oriented. Uh, and down below, this is, I went just looking for uh, an image for agri-food and I found the glory. This is the front page of our Minister of Finance's Council on Economic Growth's report in April 2019. And it's really important to consider the fact that at the federal level, and truthfully, it trickles right down um, to, munis to municipal governments in this country, our understanding of our agri-food as it would be at agri is, is about business and production and exports, right? And that to me is a really huge deal. This report is like 46 pages long. I downloaded the thing and scrolled through it to see there's all kinds of glorious infographics and I'll talk about maximizing sales and exports. But it is incredible to me that we have an agri-food movement, right? And, and agri-food is, I looked it up and it is just the process of producing food through agriculture. Right? It, talks, it says nothing really about where that food is headed, which is where things start getting complicated as far as I'm concerned, because we have a 40-some page document about our nation's agri-food movement that makes zero mention uh, of, of our, our, na our national food security. Right? There's zero talk about the idea that we need to produce food to keep Canadians well-fed, and that whatever is surplus can then be, you know, can then move towards thinking about business and exports. We don't have that priority anywhere. So we have a food security and food systems conversation that spins completely exclusively from this mega conversation we have about agri-food, right? And unfortunately, the bigger reality is that this agri-food business is the only thing 
that our politicians really engage themselves with. For whatever reason, they are not connected to this whole other piece about our national food security. Uh, and who's got, whose eyes are on that? Who's watching to make sure that we all have enough to eat and that, and that we use the food that we grow here to feed us all, right? It seems pretty natural to me that we would prioritize that, um, but the truth is that we don't. So when we are talking about this industrial food system that uses these mega machines, you know, that there's this vibe on the land, uh, there are three big elements that I want to highlight. First, we're talking about monoculture farms that use pesticides in a prophylactic way. You see this contraption is prophylactically spraying uh, the crops. There's large machinery involved, and often we're talking about GMO or genetically modified organisms. Uh, GMO seed is being used. So really, this, the, the focus here is really about incredible misuse of the land, right? Monoculture farming is a terrible thing to do to the land. Uh, the land is largely quite dead, right? The soil is quite dead after a few seasons like this and unusable. Uh, and so people just sort of move on to fresh land uh, and leave the dead land in, in its wake. Um, there's also the fossil fuels required to burn to run those machines is another important piece. Uh, and then there's GMO seed, which does everything from... Uh, you know, have impacts in our bodies to really creating a lot of socio-political, economic uh, oppression, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, to farmers on the ground who have to deal with the companies who sell these things. Oops. Next is large-scale standardized production of food often for the lowest price possible. This is about conveyor belts, this is about large production, this is about cheap loaves of bread. Right? This is what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of something made exactly the same way. And then once we have all of these things made exactly the same way for the lowest possible price, oh man, I'm killing my punchlines here. Uh, we pack them into trucks and drive them all over the planet uh, or fly them or ship them all over the planet right? Food is transported all over the planet. Produce is harvested early and ripens on the truck or the plane or the ship. Uh, and the important piece here is that the transportation of food is the single largest contributor to climate change. We look at the transportation industry and vilify them, but what we are not connected to is that it's the transportation of food that is actually the biggest piece here, right? Uh, so, when you look at these three mega things, they're pretty dismal stories. Why are we doing this? Why is this happening? Why is this the state of the, of the world right now? And generally speaking, there are a few other elements, but really it's because we want it to, right? We want fruit platters that look like this all year round. We want, to, we want uh, and we're sort of complaining about the fact that the melon doesn't taste good. Uh, but the truth is, if I was picked under ripened and then put on a car in a cardboard box and shipped to the other side of the world, uh, I'd be pretty sour and nasty as well, right? It's, it, they, we, they, we, they have earned that sourness. Um, and we want the produce section in our grocery stores to always greet us this way, right? We, as consumers, we have created a set of expectations for our food that have now created a pretty extraordinary system um, that really, in my opinion, is, is becoming increasingly less um, relevant and viable right? Because it is proving itself to be completely unsustainable. Okay, so now we've filled ourselves with talks about <laughs> the bad news about the situation. What's next? What are we going to do next? Uh, and that is exciting, right? What is the alternative? Enter our friends uh, at Kiss the Ground. Uh, so this movie came out just recently. I believe it was the end of the summer it came out, and it's essentially they are anchoring a good news story in a renewed focus on our soil quality and our, our literal relationship with the earth. Um, and so there are, the, the movie, there's lots, of, I don't, I'm not gonna take too much time to really walk you through all of the bits of the movie. I'd like you to just watch it and enjoy it. But one of the key pieces that I think we all need to pay attention to is this wisdom about the soil, right? About the kind of soil that we need to focus on and that we need to reinvest ourselves in building. I love this wisdom about the idea that there are more microbes in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on the planet. Um, and so if you consider this with the previous bit about the idea that food is the way we receive nutrients from the earth and stay alive, it enables us to really uh, shift our priorities to understand the importance of the quality of the soil that we grow our food in, right? Uh, this is it. This is this is our life force here, um, and this is the kind of thing that we have tossed aside in favor of uh, high yields, making lots of money, 
uh, and making lots of money, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so let's move along to a uh, good news story here is that regenerative agricultural systems actually produce healthier and tastier food. They support clean air and water, and they contribute to a future we can proudly pass on to our grandchildren. So those of you who have seen the film, they, they, they did some major time investment here because they actually, uh, they actually took one farm, split it in half, and treated one half of the farm with regenerative agricultural practices and the other with conventional. And we can see now how a few seasons later, the incredible difference, right? Obviously, or I can confirm that the farm on the left is the regenerative agriculture, is the regenerative spot, and the farm on the right is the conventional uh, industrial model. Um, but to see these stark differences in not a lot of time, right? I think one of the most encouraging things to me was that this, this simple adjustment to how we farm on the land has relatively rapid results. Within a season, they are able to see change, right? And I think um, this is probably, I think it's probably two or three seasons out uh, that they were seeing such remarkable difference uh, in the quality of the land uh, and, and obviously the quality of the soil. But okay, so great, we have this awesome new idea about how we're gonna grow our food. What does that mean? How is that actually going to translate to addressing that whole list of issues that I just talked about? And this is where things get really interesting for me uh, because I believe really strongly and a lot of the wisdom that I have from my experience is that food is the most efficient and effective focus for how we build communities, cities, and nations. Good food policy automatically means good agriculture, health, labor, trade, education, and culture policy. If you treat the land properly, then the food that grows on it will actually nourish the people who need to eat it, right? And if people get paid a fair wage to do work on a land, then labor policy is, and, then, and, and people's uh, health and success outcomes will automatically grow. If we pay people fairly, then we are more inclined to, do, to trade fairly, right? And then if we wrap it all up in a cultural experience, we have education and culture anchors all around the idea about our relationship with food. And the important thing here is that these are not like crazy new hippie granola ideas that I have come up with, right? This is like the original civilizations and early cities were all built primarily and, and, and at the you know, top priority was around access to food, right? And it's only because we have decided to detour and not let food be quite as important that things have taken uh, the turn that they have. So how do we get back to this, right? How do we reconnect ourselves? Uh, and what uh, I see there being three really important shifts that we have to make in our minds, really, uh, about how we understand things uh, and how we understand our relationship uh, to our food system. So uh, first things first, uh, a quote from one of my favorite ladies. Uh, this is Vandana Shiva, who is a physicist and a very, very vocal uh, environmental and anti-GMO activist. Uh, and she's incredibly bold. Uh, she's a full-on scientist and to watch her speak and to, to the way she deals with a, a, the lineup of question of doubters, right, uh, is just remarkable. The way she just lines people up and knocks them down is, in, is, a, is a very inspiring thing to see. But this idea that all transformation comes from the joy of the thought of the better state Take your mind to the place you want to be, right? And the inspiration for seeing that future uh, will be the fuel it takes to get through the messiness uh, of actually making this change. So first things first, I want to encourage us to move from an unanimated to an animated state. Um, there are homes, kitchens, communities across the globe that have become really disconnected from good food uh, for a variety of reasons, right? We're talking the detrimental impact that a lack of access to good food can have on a life is really, really significant. And I heard this quote uh, from an organizer. Oh, sorry, ha ha ha, these are my three points. This girl doesn't know her slides. Um, oh my goodness. Oh, everybody, here. I can get a semi-automatic weapon easier than I can get a tomato in my neighborhood. And this is a woman uh, who's a community organizer in Chicago. Uh, this truth to me is serious, right? And a bit heartbreaking. Um, but the thing is, I also know that it works the other way. Increasing access to good food can reanimate a person. It can actually bring communities back to life because you are putting the life force back in. I have seen this happen repeatedly in my work in community food security and in the hospitals and schools that I've worked with. I have watched individual people, communities, and institutional kitchens 
literally come back to life with an increased connection to good food and real cooking. Next is this transactional um, experience to one of engagement. Uh, and this is about our relationship with eating. We need to move the experience from being, uh, sorry, the industrial and capitalist food system has effectively reduced our experience of food down to a transaction. Food is simply something we purchase, prepare, and consume. There's no connection to the hands that move our food from field to kitchen to table in this model. A more sustainable connected model has us moving from the transaction to engagement with producers, purveyors, and cooks. Engagement lets us revalue the hands required to put good food on the table and make deeper connections uh, to the land and our community while we're doing it. The transaction focuses on what we can get, engagement focuses on what we can be a part of. And this, this, this is really one of my favorite bits, right? A little shift in our attitude uh, changes everything. So this is a collection of our institutional kitchen staff. You can see the Ryerson Eats team is there. I would take all of my institutional teams out to the farm to just get their hands in the soil and get a bit of connection to the ideas that I was trying to sell about good food. Um, and once one of the tray assembly staff came up to me and we, this, this farm uh, makes gorgeous salad greens in Cremor. Uh, and they said, are we really going to serve this food to patients? Uh, and I said, yeah, that's the, that's the plan, right? And I could see her face lit up. And she said to me, I will be so proud to serve these meals to patients, right? And I was like, oh, I was hugging her and I'm weeping and all the things are happening. Uh, but it's just, it's a really important understanding that it's, it's less just about who delivers things. And, and, and really connecting to what we are a part of here, right? We don't eat in isolation. We don't cook in isolation, uh, and we definitely don't grow and produce our food in isolation. Um, and so that takes us perfectly to the final point, which is to move us from isolation to connection, right? We, uh, and this is perhaps really important right now as we are all so literally isolated from each other. Um, this, another quote from another favorite lady of mine, uh, you need to know that you are in a continuum. And once you understand that, you realize that you are worthwhile. Uh, I ran community kitchens for many years. Uh, and one of the most important impacts of that program actually had nothing to do with the food. Right? Time and time again, our participants would tell us that coming to the kitchen and out of their isolation was one of the most valuable things about the program. Uh, situations like poverty and illness can really isolate people from each other and from access to good food. Uh, on a more personal level, we eat at our desks, in our cars, in front of screens, and on the way to the things that we're prioritizing over our meals. Uh, and to add technology into this, and you've got a recipe for further disconnection and isolation. Um, and so uh, finding, uh, rethinking this choice really opens us up to many connections with our food, with the land, and with each other. Um, this quote from Dr. Angelo really anchors this for me because it, it, it reminds us and it reminds me in the work that I do that we matter, right? You and I matter, our choices matter, uh, and what we eat matters. Uh, and we must understand that the choices that we make here have a ripple effect that, that are felt clear across the planet. Um, and that is super important, regardless, right? Just like the, the everybody wanting to make burgers, were, you know, were resulting in spikes uh, in COVID cases in meat processing plants as staff go, you know, to do that. Or the fact that once we stop buying lattes every morning, this mega dairy surplus is something that we have to deal with. We are connected to each other. Uh, and for better or for worse, this pandemic has really taught us that, right? It has brought tears to my eyes to witness it sometimes. Uh, and other times it's just, it's just so beautiful, right? It's just so gorgeous for me to see the truth of this uncovered because it's something that I have sort of had a hope and suspicion about for a while. It's not always very visible. I just know in my gut that this feels like the right idea. Um, but I have witnessed this and I've seen it happen. Um, and I have seen in as much as, in as much disconnection has happened, I have seen so much beautiful reconnection. People have reached out, people have understood that food is a way that we can really actively take care of each other. Um, and that has, been, that has been one of the real gifts of this incredibly difficult situation. So what we have learned, investing in a good relationship with food allows you to be more firmly rooted in your own humanity and nourished by your connection with the earth. 
Uh, there are a lot of other things to learn here, but I really want to focus on this one as perhaps one of the most important pieces, right? We all, this in this moment of insecurity and, uh, and so much that's unknown, uh, I really want, I really want to encourage everybody to really find an anchor in food. You can trust it, right? It's, I remember in the spring or the sort of early summer when the asparagus started to grow and we'd see this on the table, you know, our farmers would talk about it. I was so thankful and relieved that this, that, you know, while everything else seems so crazy, mother nature is still doing her thing, right? And food was still being grown and then the strawberries came and oh my God, the peaches and it all has been such a delicious, beautiful harvest. Um, and, and I'm really encouraging people to dive into that, right? And listen, we can see the evidence of this happening because we can't find a mason jar anywhere in the country, uh, right? And because people are literally locking the harvest and locking the food up in the jars, right? We don't know what the future holds, but there should be good food. Uh, and that I love. Other important lessons here is that our largely industrial food system is unsustainable and starting to fail us. Right. It's uh, there's uh, there's so many more conversations to have. But when I saw those empty shelves, uh, it's important to connect to the fact that those are in our large grocery stores. Those are large national distribution. Right. We have maybe three lines of distribution that bring product into that network of stores. Uh, and we did not see the same barren shelf scenario in mom and pop grocery stores, you know, corner stores. Uh, Fiesta Farms is one of my favorites here in Toronto. Uh, that was not the same story. And it's important to see that there, you, it's visibly obvious, right? Uh, that the likes of uh, large scale national distributors were not as focused uh, caring for communities as the grassroots markets were. Um, and then the last piece, and this is really from uh, the movie, is that our soil is damaged and in desperate need of reinvestment uh, from us. So, something we've also learned is that regenerative organic agriculture is, in fact, a viable, low-cost, effective, joyful solution to these problems, right? Uh, when I was writing about this in my book, my editor was reviewing the section, and she really, because essentially the, the wisdom is about putting tarps down on the land, right, and cover cropping to actually sequester uh, and pull the carbon back into the land. And she kept on, in her comments, she was like, is this really just about a tarp? Is this whole brilliant idea just about getting a tarp? And while it is, it is more nuanced than that, to a certain degree, the investment required is little more than this sheeting and just some new thinking about how you organize your farm. Um, the important thing here though, is that this is very possible. It's very available. It is workable. It's effective. And the joy is there. The trick is, and the thing that I think we all need to really connect to is that we just have to choose it. Right? We have to decide that this is what we want. We have to be conscious about this decision. We have to know what we're, we have to know what's on the line for us, right? Uh, and, and this moment in time has really illustrated that. Uh, and so make, having more consciousness about your food choices and about your relationship to your food system and what, what you prefer, what maybe is or is not worth the convenience that it might have been previously, uh, I think is all really coming into question here. Um, so, uh, one thing that I want to highlight to you is that on the Kiss the Ground website, uh, they have some incredible resources. And I put the URL here in white, thekissthegroundcom for their purchasing guide. This is what the page looks like. I encourage you all to visit. You can download the guide and it is a beautiful resource for understanding the issues and then really beautiful, tangible marching orders as it would be for, for changes and impacts that you can have as an individual person living in your house trying to contribute to a more positive outcome. Uh, so visit this, uh, visit this website, please. Uh, get this guide for yourself uh, uh, you know, after, you watch, after you watch the movie, uh, and then you'll be really well situated um, to take action and to get involved. Um, I, I've got a quote here from a, a pal of mine who I love very much. Uh, he, James Rebanks is a shepherd, if you can imagine. Um, he is, uh, he lives in Cumbria in Northern England. Uh, I went to visit him and went shepherding with him on this beautiful land. His family has been shepherding on this land for like 400 years. Uh, right. And that blows my mind as somebody who has twice migrated from the place she was born. It is amazing. But I, he, he, he offered this quote up that I love so much. There's nothing that says more about a society than the way it treats its land and feeds itself. Um, a book, he's written a couple of books, and 
if you are interested in this conversation and the story, this broader understanding about our relationship to the land, uh, I highly, highly recommend jumping into some of James's work. The Shepherd's Life came out, I believe, in 2017, and it kind of blew everybody's minds about such a gloriously modern story from this incredibly ancient land. And he has recently just published this book called English Pastoral, which is more of his really gorgeous reflections uh, about the land and his relationship. I highly recommend James Rebanks. Uh, plus his Twitter feed is quite hilarious. Uh, and finally, um, I want to, uh, to bring us back to the idea that our food choices say a lot about who we are. Uh, and I want to leave you with a question about what do you think your food choices, your food choices, sorry, say about you? Um, I'll leave you with that. And of course, the shameless uh, plug for my book. This is uh, the book that I've just written about my work in public institutions, but it covers so many of the things that I have just talked about, including regenerative agriculture uh, and, um, and new ways for rebuilding our food systems for the future. Woo! All right, we did it. Uh, we have enough time. There's time for questions. Uh, and Chris, maybe you're going to help me out with that. I would love that. Yes, I'd be happy to help. Um, we had quite a few questions come in before the event when people were registering. So I'm just going to go through them as they came so in, if I that's okay with this. you. Yes, of course. And let's go to this. Here we go. All right. So the first question, and I'm sorry, I did not write the person's name, but okay. the person asked, what are your thoughts on community fridges? Yes. Uh, we've seen, we saw a lot of this. I think they're wonderful. I love the spirit of them. I like the idea that people, and what has, what has uh, resulted from them has been really beautiful community connections because the thing is, what the need that I think a community fridge really serves is the fact that it, it opens up access to perishable food, right? People who are food insecure need access to food that is, that is not curiously non-perishable, right? More than things out of cans uh, or things that will remarkably stay on a shelf for a very long time. Uh, and the community fridge really addresses that. It is not, it is not a complete answer for our food security problem right? But it is definitely a beautiful and, and really effective way to connect communities uh, on the ground, right? I have loved seeing uh, what once were those beautiful little libraries and neighborhoods have turned into pantries and people are doing a shop and, you know, packing some canned goods, nice nut butters and beans and good things like that in there. Uh, so community fridges, I think, are wonderful and have a great... And uh, a lot of people are like, oh, but the food safety, the food safety. Uh, I think that that is just something that we can say because we don't want to take our minds to a new idea. I think we can, there's a lot of trust in people to do the right thing and have instinct about the right thing. There's process, you know, around how to store things well. It's very viable and I think a very beautiful community uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. Certainly a great spirit. Um, the next question I have is, what exactly can people like me who are stuck at home like mm -hmm. all of us, um, do to be able to help out in the distribution of food? Yes, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and had we not all been isolated in our homes, I would have told you to get out there and volunteer and get into a garden and, and cook some meals and pack some boxes. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that is just not the right thing to do right now. So if you uh, have both the desire to do it and the means to do it, uh, all those organizations who are on the ground doing it could really use some financial support. Uh, our places like Food Share, The Stop, I'm sure there are plenty community organizations in Hamilton uh, who are really meeting people's needs on the ground. Uh, so while it's perhaps not as sexy an option, uh, uh, offering some money if you have some to share would be super, super helpful right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's lots of people in need, that's for sure. Okay, this one's a little more personal. How did your path towards social activism start and how did you reach people initially versus now? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, so the activism grew, um, I went, uh, so Slow Food is a global organization that really focuses on, as they say, um, maintaining the traditions of the table, which is very lovely. Um, and they have an annual conference every two years in Italy. And we all, all those of us who are on the team get to go and swim in the glory of Italy for a while while listening to issues about our food system, about, you know, harsh realities about what's happening. Um, and, that, and so I had the delight to go. I went twice, 2008 and 2010. And when I came back, I remember being on the plane thinking, oh, okay. And that's where I like, I heard Vanina Shiva speak for the first time, right? And I was blown away. 
Um, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Got it. This is my plan. Um, and so when I had this ideal about what it could be or what it should be in my mind and what I saw around me in the world, particularly when I graduated from culinary school, which was after university, it just, it was so, the distance was so far away. And I realized that somebody needed to stand there and be in defense of our, you know, in support of our food system. Uh, because the convenience uh, and the industrial, the, 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 you know, the oppression of the, the big machine is hard to take on. Uh, and I felt really fueled by that, uh, by the fact that I didn't hear enough of the, this other voice that I wanted to hear, right? And then we started hearing from people like Michael Pollan and Wendell Berry and the books, you know, started to get written. Eric Schlosser is another voice, Raj Patel, uh, about this issue. Um, and I found my community, right? And I found my people. Uh, but one of the loveliest things I can tell you is that, um, look, my degree, religious studies, minor in women's studies. We all know that there's no job at the end of that. Uh, but I can tell you now, 15 years into it, into actually being a chef this way, I have really understood that um, the way to motivate people's behavior, right? Because I really want to motivate people to change their behavior. The best way to do it is to focus on what they believe. And I have realized that my religious studies degree has in fact served me very well there uh, in really orienting me to the power uh, of religion. Cause that's what really, you know, that's what it does. It gets into people's hearts and minds about things. Uh, and so those two things together, I think have given me the tools that I have used uh, to try and uh, that and Vanina Shiva's story about making this all look so dreamy and enticing. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear your Mac. Uh, I know, I know, you I well. know. My That's... mom had a great laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, changing gears a little bit again. Are mm. rooftop and indoor vertical food farms a sustainable and effective way of growing a city's food needs? Uh, I will say yes wholeheartedly to the rooftop. Not as much because they yield on the on like unless we're talking about an actual greenhouse that's you know talk, that's you know thoughtful structured indoor growing uh the little the things you see in sort of cafeteria dining rooms and stuff are great for salad greens and herbs wonderful hydroponic lights can keep those going but i am more excited about what can happen on rooftops right when i was at ryerson we used the rooftop of the engineering building and we had a quarter acre farm up there and in our first year we grew 2,000 pounds of organic produce. Uh, and if you imagine, it was at Young and Dundas, which is like one of the busiest intersections in North America. And it should be noted that while we got the green light from the engineers about mm -hmm. weight capacity and to grow food, you know what I mean? We got all of that sort of, I was like, this ceiling, this roof is not caving down on my watch. So please do not grow any pumpkins or, right? <laughs> Don't give me any of that. Give me kale, give me chili, you know what I mean? Give me herbs. Uh, nothing, no potatoes, really light no food. squash, right? Uh, right. So 2,000 pounds of not, of not pumpkins, right? It is extremely viable, right? And that food went right back into food services. Uh, so capacities for rooftops are huge, even here uh, in this land of a limited growing season. Okay. I think you sort of alluded to this question before, your opinion of the slow food movement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean... Could you I mean, is that just my, so uh, it's, it's an important thing to address. Philosophically, my heart is with them, right? These are the words that I will, you know, I, the ideas, but we have very different ideas uh, about how to actually implement these things on the ground, uh, right? I have, like, there is a practice, uh, I don't, I don't want to be dismissive of those ideas because I think it's important for people to keep the lights on about that, right? About these sort of dreamier notions about our time at the table and, you know, and, and you know, breaking bread and all this very lovely romantic stuff. Um, but that is the fuel that, that, and I have realized that I needed to go somewhere else to find the really more practical grassroots strategies for actually how to pull this off, how to convince politicians to, to listen to me, you know, all those things, unfortunately is not so high up on the slow food uh, agenda. So uh, they're, they are a piece of the story. Let's say that. They don't have all of the bits. I think we need this other piece to really work together. Um, but I have been uh, anchored and inspired about, by my connection with Slow Food for sure. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I wanted to ask a question yeah. because I think for me, I mean, it's wonderful to keep things local. I love the 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 idea of that you're employing local people you're mm. eating food that was growing locally but when i watched the movie because i did do my homework yes. um 
I got a little overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. And right. this, you know, how you talk about the monoculture and, and you know, yes. our finance ministers are focusing on this import export. And, and so how, how do you go about kind of atta attacking that mm -hmm. large scale of a problem? It's a, it's, a, it's a really important question because you can keep, you know, pick your head up and take a look at the thousands and thousands of acres of land that are devoted to this one thing, right? And, and the, across this whole planet, this story is very much the same. Uh, and there's, there's actually much, much more that I haven't even touched on in terms of implications for people, farmers' lives. However, um, I have also realized in this work that change can happen sometimes in 10 minutes in the right office with the right conversation with the people who actually have power, right? And so I have decided that I will keep yelling and screaming uh, and in increasingly loud, you know, obnoxious, increasingly obnoxious ways uh, because I really want to talk about this, right? I really want to talk to our national leaders uh, to say, this is a very doable thing. I need you to get your head right about this, right? I need to, right? Because really the pitch that I have waiting for Justin the minute he's ready to have a conversation with me about it <laughs> is that we need a ministry of food, right? Mm -hmm. That is a, and that minister needs to be somebody who is super friendly, who can get along with everybody else because they're going to have to work with all the other ministers in some way. Right. And is there something that other people can do too? I mean, you know, we sort of had that question yeah, before. What can we is, do uh, from where we we're sitting? Some of the some of the actually really cool opportunities that that we've seen here in Toronto is there was an issue about some land that was originally zoned for a golf course to be made into a golf course or a series of golf courses in and around the city. And one of my friends who um, runs Foodshare, was a wonderful uh, grassroots food organization, he pitched the idea and got a lot of community support around the idea that what actually, that we should not be zoning those for, for, for golf courses and that those should actually be community farms right in the city, right? And that is easy to even, even just to petition city council to do a community consultation on the issue. Mm -hmm. Right. So open it up to have a meeting and let us attend a meeting and let us advocate for the idea that we the, the, we we don't actually have a golf crisis in the city, but we definitely have a food crisis in the city. Uh, right. And so these are really tangible ways because a lot of times these meetings happen or things get passed and they're things that we're not really paying attention to. Um, but I have found a lot of groundswell and I've made great connections with my city councilor because he has now heard my very loud request uh, for community consultation on this issue and the idea that there are community groups ready to move into that space and mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. uh, community growing. So uh, municipal political action is, in fact, a thing. Uh, okay. right? It is definitely a thing that we can do uh, to push for change uh, and, to, and to demand better things. Also, make a nuisance of yourself in grocery stores. Right, the in the in the Kiss the Ground um, PDF that you can download, there's lots of this type of beautiful information about making a pain in the butt of yourself to your produce manager, uh, and and encouraging your children to do that is even more exciting. Okay, now here's kind of an interesting question. Um, some people, this person Ronald says, I've recently heard an opinion that food banks are just band aids, not mm -hmm. solutions. What do you think? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an idea that's been floated around for as long as I've been doing this work, right? And there's a lot of people, uh, Raven, there's a, a lovely collection of people here at U of T who think that the truth that, about this issue around food security is that we need to shut down all food banks and emergency feeding programs and use all of those resources towards advocacy for things like uh, higher social assistance rates or you know, guaranteed basic income and things because these are actually the root causes of food insecurity. Um, and while philosophically I understand the issue because we all know that addressing a root cause is a much more effective way to deal with a problem, uh, we, need to, we need to eat three times a day. The human yeah. bodies still need to be maintained, right? And so I, I cannot imagine the idea that we would stop serving people, you know, and stop uh, providing food through food banks and dining programs. Because remember, the stuff that we are giving people in dining programs and through food banks is largely just enabling them to eat one meal a day, right? This is not even really meeting the need, right? They're, nobody's getting three meals a day uh, in dining programs and in food banks, right? It's just to ensure that something goes in to their mouths and to their bellies at least once a day. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this, unfortunately, if we didn't have this really crucial life or death kind of element here, I would hold, I would jump in on this idea that we need to just focus on advocacy. Um, but it's, it's this very delicate balance, you know, between the two, which I think, unfortunately, slows the process down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the need is clearly so great, as you said. Um, okay, we're going to have two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, how do you present these um, ideas that people might consider radical yes. uh, and unrealistic, and how do you make it more palatable mm -hmm. for people? Yes, great question. Something that I think about all the time. Uh, and the, the most valuable thing that I have come up with for myself was a reminder that the thing, that what I'm trying to sell here is actually not a new idea, right? Uh, the, and, and, and I saw this when I was in hospitals, right? When I got into those hospitals, once the staff realized what I was trying to do, they started pulling out old recipe boxes. And I saw that there was a hook in the fridge where a side of beef used to hang because they used to actually break down a whole animal and there were five vegetable cooks and I saw the bread ovens, right? So this, like, we used to do this. We used to cook fresh food on site in institutions every day. We used to not grow food by spring, you know, uh, and that was sprayed with pesticides before we ate it. Um, and it's important to remember that where we are now in this highly uh, industrialized, commercial, capitalized version of our food system is the detour, right? The, the norm, the regular way to do things. We know how to do this as humans. The way we built these systems uh, was about respecting the land and growing good food and making sure everybody had access to good food. As soon as we got the money in there and decided we needed to maximize and, you know what I mean, and make things more efficient, that's when things took a turn. So, so we know how to do this. Our, our wisdom just as human beings exists on the side of these values. And so what I am trying to do is just pull us back, mm -hmm. right? Is, to, is to, to get us back to something a little more in line with taking care of all of us on this planet. Um, and, help, and that has really helped people to understand that what I'm doing is not radical. Right, it's uh, it, it may like they uh, they're largely seeing it potentially out of a package that they have never encountered before, but the message is not radical. The idea that human beings should have really good food is not radical. What is insane is that we have all kind of unwittingly allowed the system to detour so dramatically that all 37, 38 million of us in this country uh, don't have enough food to eat every day. Mm -hmm. that's right, true. that's that's the crazy. That's the madness of the situation. Yeah. And so last question, and this is sort of on a smaller scale. Yes. What can we do to grow our own food on a small plot, plot of land in terms of regenerating the soil on our own, in our own yes. backyards? Uh, it's a wonderful thought. And there's so much uh, possible. Get yourself connected to some community gardens. Uh, I know that there are plenty of them all over uh, our cities. Um, and then connect yourself to uh, an organic seed grower to really get some good organic seeds. And, and there's lots of wisdom. In fact, even in that PDF from Kiss the Ground is there are a couple of links to, I think it's called like the soil story or the soil project, which can really get you connected to how to set up even a little, you know what I mean? One meter by two meter, a little something in your backyard, uh, right? Can enable you to produce food for yourself. You invest in your own soil in a really sort of contained way, uh, either in a community plot or at your house. Um, and there's, there's tons of wisdom that's out there uh, to show you how to grow these things. And you like the, you'll be just really, really happy, right? The flavor is out of this world. Um, and the satisfaction, I think, of attempting to, you know, to reroot that needle uh, and make some change, I think is so incredibly rewarding. Well, I'm just sorry we can't go get our, get in our gardens today. I know, no. I know. It's right. We <laughs> get out there right now and let's do this. Um, well, thank you so much, Josh. Now, this was such a pleasure. And oh, you're so welcome. Thank, thank you, you for, well, just being persistent and passionate about this cause. It's, um, it's really fun to watch you, you know, do this. And I'm hoping that a lot of us will sort of join you in your Amazing. fight. Thank yeah, you. That's and, super kind. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very alive on social media and super happy to interact. Uh, would love to connect with any of you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for considering this. Um, and also please remember, uh, although this feels wildly overwhelming with all of the pieces we have to address, 
one of the beautiful things about food is that there are these little things that you can do that actually make a difference. If we all, this is one of those scenarios why tiny little bits of action from all of us can in fact change market understandings and reroute policy, right? We can do this. I'm so uh, confident and encouraged about that possibility. Well, you're certainly very inspiring. So thank you again, Josh, and thank you to everyone out there who's joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, you'll see in your inbox soon, uh, just a little survey. Please fill it out and give us your feedback. We read it all and um, have a wonderful evening. Thanks again, Joshna. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening.